Next up is a round of short talks focused on how data-driven artificial intelligence is revolutionizing life science research. In applications from drug discovery to diagnostic development, the speakers today will give you a look into how AI can help us glean exciting new insights into protein structures, tumor cell state, and the immune system. Here we go. Hi everyone, this is Ying Tse from Microsoft Research. Today, I will present our new work about drug discovery. The name is Tamgent, which is short for Target Aware Molecule Generation with Transformer. First, let us review the process of drug discovery. There are four steps. The first one is target identification, which is usually to find possible proteins or nucleic acid in our body that a drug will bind to. After that, Based on the target, we design the compounds, like the HIT compounds, and optimize the HIT to lease and preclinical compounds. After that, we went into the preclinical trials, where we will test our designed compounds on cells, on animals, and so on. If the results are good, finally, we move to the clinical trials, where we will test our compounds on humans, and there are usually three phases. If everything is good, then we succeed. This is a very long process, which takes tens of years, and this is a cost, costly process, which takes billions of dollars. An important step for drug discovery is how to select the compounds. People usually use high throughput screening or virtual screening to select the candidate drugs. High throughput screening is the use of automatic equipment to rapidly test thousands to millions of drugs for biological activity. And virtual screening do the similar thing but using computer programs to select possible promising drugs. They all rely on the molecule library, and there are two limitations of these two methods. First, it is very costly to enumerate all the compounds in a large library. And even for the largest library, it is much smaller than the complete chemical space. The second limitation is that the selected drugs like of the novelty. So the novelty is limited by the molecule library. So what we can do? Our strategy here is that given the target, we want to use a model to directly generate a compound for the given target so that we can improve efficiency and we can get novel drugs. Let us see our method. And this is our framework called Tamgent, which is short for Target Aware Molecule Generation with Transformer because the framework is built upon Transformer. The encoder is a variant of the Transformer model where it encodes the protein information, including the 3D coordinates and the amino acid information. With it, we can get hidden representations of the pocket. After that, we fit the features into the decoder where we will generate the smiles of the compounds. So let us see more details about the encoder. So in the encoder, we design a distance aware attention that can capture the geometric information of the amino acids. And the decoder is pre-trained on 10 million compounds from PubChem, and you can regard it as a SMILES GPT, which is similar to the GPT in natural language processing. This is more details about the encoder and the decoder. OK, let's see the results. First, we see the docking results. We compare our method with different methods. One is a purely deep learning method, which can directly generate the 3D drugs in the spatial space. And the second method is a hybrid method, which is a combination of the deep learning method and the evolutional method. We can see that in terms of the docking score, we achieve the best score, and lower scores indicate stronger binding affinity. We can see our method is the best in terms of both the mean score and the distribution. And we can see that there are still differences between the distribution of our method, the baseline, and the ground truth. So this means that we have much space to further improve our method. In terms of the speed, we can see that the decoding speed per target of our method is less than one second. However, for the baselines, 
we take more than 25 minutes to decode one target. So this is another advantage of a method, where it, which is that our method is very efficient. Let's see some case. The first case is the results on drug bank, where it, we input three targets from drug bank and let our method tangent to generate the corresponding compounds. And for these three cases, our method can generate both the reference drug as shown in the drug band and a new compound. The reference drug is the green one in this picture, and the new compound is the colored one in this picture. We can see that our method can generate compounds with better docking score, and the new drug can bind with the target. Let's see some cases on SARS-CoV-2. And this is a pandemic in the world. And uh, you know that the SARS-CoV-2 main protein is a promising target for this disease. So we improve the main protein into our model and check what our model generate. And we can see that our model actually generate thousands of compounds for it. And we select some promising ones. Here are two examples. They both have very good docking scores and they fill the pocket of the main protein. More importantly, these two drugs can form hydrogen bonds to some important amino acids of SARS-CoV-2 main protein. One is the histidine 41 and the other is the cysteine 145. So this shows the potential of a method and based on this, on this candidate, the expert can design, more strong, can design stronger drugs for this disease. We hope our method can bring some inspiration to the community. And here is the summary. What we propose is a generative solution for drug design. And our method can generate both the novel drugs and known drugs. And our method is efficient in terms of both the quality and generation speed. So this is the summary. Finally, this is the acknowledgement. I want to thank so many people. This is a joint work as a team. I'd like to thank the interns Ke Han and Yang, and the biologists Pan and Hai Guang, and the computer scientists, including Li Jun, Shu Fang, Tong, Tao, and Tian Yan. That's all. Thank you for your attention. Hello, everyone. My name is Ava Amini. I'm a senior researcher at Microsoft Research New England, and I'm thrilled to have time to share with you some of our recent work in developing computational methods and frameworks to optimize tumor organoids for precision cancer medicine. We're fundamentally motivated by this ambitious vision of precision medicine, where the aim is to generate rich, multimodal data about a patient's state of disease, and then learn from and integrate this information to try to personalize clinical management. However, even today, being in the era of genetic sequencing and emerging technologies that help us measure disease biology, the fact remains that the majority of cancer patients do not and cannot benefit from this precision medicine approach. This is because our current paradigm is focused on finding particular mutations in the DNA of cancer cells and then trying to match drugs based on these single metrics in an ad hoc and reductionist way cutting off so many patients who do not match to the very limited number of targeted therapies that exist. The way that this is studied and thought about in the lab is by actually taking a sample of a cancer tumor, for example, from a biopsy, and then growing some of those cancer cells in the lab, ex vivo or out of the body, to try to study their biology, screen drugs, and see how they respond. The way that biologists do this is by using either cell lines or actual 3D cultures of cells that we call organoids as a way to model the tumor in the experimental lab. Now, despite this being a very widely used paradigm, this current pipeline, which focuses almost exclusively on DNA mutations, faces a few key limitations. First, that our current cell and organoid models sacrifice the rich heterogeneity, complexity, and nuances that exist across the whole tumor, resulting in this big gap between the biology of the cell models that can be grown and studied in the lab and the actual tumor disease biology that exists within the patient. 
Because of this, downstream, we have this lack of scalability in our inability to precisely identify effective drugs and design new therapies that are personalized for the patient. And so these, these limitations have motivated us to envision and pursue new methods that will unlock an ability to learn, model, and target entire cell states rather than just DNA changes for a new approach to precision cancer medicine. At Microsoft, the reason why we're so excited to look at cancer through this lens of state is the scale, complexity, and multimodality of the data we're able to work with from DNA mutations to the identity and strength of genes that are expressed in individual cells at different times, to actually capturing and measuring their interactions with each other and their local environment. All this data comes together to reach, reach an enormous scale, an estimate of over 44 million individual data points for just one sample from just one patient. It's these challenges of scale complexity, and heterogeneity that provide a perfect opportunity for us at Microsoft Research, where we're uniquely suited to solve these challenges from multiple perspectives, in research, in computation, and in engineering, to create foundational solutions that learn from these rich data to advance new and optimized approaches to precision cancer medicine. Today, I'll share a first work from our team where we've directed this idea towards pancreatic cancer, a cancer that has an extremely high mortality rate and for which so few treatment options exist. Underlying this is this fact that most pancreatic cancer patients have a set of key DNA alterations, but there are no effective therapies that work against these genetic targets. Furthermore, despite how common these mutations are across the pancreatic cancer, patient population, there exist these drastically different gene expression signatures that result in these drastically different tumor cell states across the pancreatic cancer patient group. And it turns out that these different cell states actually correlate very significantly with patient outcomes and survival. But our current precision medicine paradigm fails to even consider these states in how we think about managing treatment and assigning therapy. So we were really motivated by this cause. And to take a step towards addressing this, we have very recently collaborated with experimental and clinical colleagues at the Broad Institute and the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute to develop an integrated framework to study and model tumor cell states ex vivo. And what we've done is we've established this workflow that allows us to go directly from tumor biopsies, which we can profile using single cell sequencing and omics technologies, to the establishment of matched lab organoid models that are made up of tumor cells that we can grow and test in the lab and can also be profiled. And finally, to integrating these components together with in silico computational methods that can analyze our observations, understand and optimize the behavior of our ex vivo models, and ultimately assess what interventions and drugs may be effective. And it's this integrated and computational framework that actually allows us to automatically compare in vivo tumor states with our ex vivo lab models and do so in an automated way in order to be able to now discover how different cell states exist. And so in pancreatic cancer, what we see is that cells from tumor biopsies exhibit these vastly different state phenotypes that's reflected in how genes are expressed and to what levels they're expressed. However, startingly and really critically, when we look at data from the corresponding matched ex vivo organoid lab models, we find that these differences in these distinct state phenotypes are completely dissolved. And so this raises this question of what is it about the in vivo tumors that's being lost and sacrificed in these lab models? To address that, we design computational methods that can systematically compare ex vivo organoids with the source biopsies 
to infer the mechanisms behind these losses of cell states. And we find that there are significant differences in the expression of particular genes related to the tumor's local microenvironment, which shows that these tumor organoids are not yet optimized in their ability to model tumor states. And furthermore, that the signals that are present within the body can be lost in these ex vivo lab culture models. So this poses this really rich and interesting question of whether or not we can actually change the culture of these lab models to try to rescue particular cell states and therefore optimize our models to try to best match a patient's actual biology. And the short answer to that question is yes. We find that after establishing these lab models, we can add back particular microenvironmental factors that were identified computationally and analytically, and that this actually rescues states that were previously lost. More importantly, by inducing these particular cellular states in our lab models, we can see that we actually can profoundly influence the cell's phenotype and response to screen drugs, meaning that we can build a better lab model that can more accurately reflect what could be a patient's response to a particular therapy. What this tells us is that tuning the underlying model system that we're testing and using in the lab, like an organoid, is really critical to be able to effectively characterize biology and drug response in cancer. And the approach that we're taking to achieve this is to first learn from this rich, high-dimensional data to identify and learn different tumor states, to then be able to generate measurements in organoids through different experimental approaches, and finally, computationally integrate this information with the aim of optimizing the organoid culture models themselves to try to create more personalized and more representative model systems. Moving forward, at Microsoft, we're developing and extending this paradigm towards achieving an end-to-end -end framework to really establish these tumor organoids as a reliable method for precision cancer medicine through developing complete analytic pipelines computational infrastructure, and optimized protocols with the ultimate goal of realizing more effective therapies and interventions for patients. With that, I'll conclude, and I'll gratefully thank all of those who have contributed to this work, both at Microsoft and in our broader collaboration team. And I'd love to follow up in any capacity to discuss further. Please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you so much. Hello, I'm Kevin K. Yang. I'm at the Microsoft Research Lab in New England. And today I'll be talking about multimodal deep learning for protein engineering. So proteins are biology's actuators. Each of her cells contain between one and three billion proteins each. They're responsible for things like structure, metabolism, and signaling. Some examples, IgG is part of your adaptive immune system. Hemoglobin carries oxygen in your blood red blood cells. Uh, insulin regulates her blood sugar. The cor coronavirus spike protein has been famous recently because it allows the virus to enter your cells through the ACE2 receptors in your lungs. And luciferase is a fun one because it makes firefly butts glow. So today we're going to talk about designing proteins and why would we want to design proteins? A few reasons. Maybe we want to do new chemistry. So some proteins are called enzymes. They're proteins that catalyze reactions. And they're responsible for biochemistry in our body. But it turns out we can repurpose these to catalyze reactions that we care about for industrial purposes. Here I'm showing an example of a neonatal reaction making uh, carbon-silicon bonds using an engineered enzyme. We might want to understand how proteins function so we can... Uh, better treat disease, or just because we're curious people. We also use proteins sometimes as therapeutics. This example is, example is asparaginase, which breaks down the amino acid asparagine. Uh, there are certain cancers where the cells have lost the ability to synthesize their own asparagine. So if you inject asparaginase into the, that region, it, kills the can it breaks down asparagine, and the cancer cells die faster than the healthy cells. So it's a chemotherapy agent. 
proteins are also useful as molecular tools. Shown here are the most famous one, which is green fluorescent protein, or GFP, which glows green. And if you tag things with it, it allows you to see things inside the cell using a microscope. So what we'd like to do is use machine learning to enable protein optimization or design while having to make fewer measurements, because having to measure proteins takes a long time and can be expensive. So the cycle kind of looks like this. You start with a parent that kind of does the thing you want. You make some variants by mutating the sequence of amino acids that makes up that protein. Then you screen or measure those sequence function pairs, and then you use that information to train a sequence function model, a machine learning model, and then use that model to decide what sequences to test next. And today we're really going to focus on the sequence function model part, which once again takes in the amino acid sequence. Proteins are made of amino acids. We're representing that sequence here as a chain of letters. There's one, each letter represents one amino acid. To try to predict uh, the fitness or the function of that protein, which is what it does or how well it does a thing that, that we're trying to optimize. Your typical machine learning guided direct evolution or MLDE campaign might include fewer than 200 measurements. And here I'm showing an example where we start, start with three parents. We're trying to increase um, the max photocurrent, which is the amount of current that this protein lets into the cell when it's exposed to a certain wavelength of light. And you can see, as time goes on, in every iteration, we find better and better uh, variants using machine learning. And we find better variants using fewer than 200, 200 measurements. And that's just because in this case, the measurements are very, very expensive and slow to make. And then, but you also notice that many of the measurements we make are for very bad or uh, non-functional proteins where they had essentially have zero photocurrents or zero function. This kind of engineering campaign also requires that our models uh, be capable of what, in machine learning terms, is called out-of-domain generalization. So in-domain general generalization is I have some data set. Uh, so each of those blue bars is a protein sequence. I'm representing a mutation with a yellow bar. And you have some training set. You train in 80%. You test on the rest. And that's our typical in-domain machine learning split. The problem with using this for engineering is that if I can measure 80% of uh, the things I want, why do I need to predict the last 20%? I can just also measure the last 20%. So what we really want to be able to do is things like measure all the single mutations. So I have some parent protein. I make uh, single mutations one at a time to the sequence, and then be able to predict the effects of combining those mutations. Or another relevant one is I don't, during training, I only see things that are worse than the parent or about the same as the parent, but I'm looking for things that are better than the parent. So it's important that my model be very accurate in those sequences. So to help us with this, we have access to large protein databases, such as you know, Ref100, uh, which has about 314 unique sequences. If we cluster these down to 90%, we can get about 151 million, cluster some more uh, to 50% or down to 54 million. If we care only want things that have been experimentally verified to exist, uh, you can use Swissbro, which is about 568,000 proteins. And if you want experimental 3D structures, then we're down to about 194,000. But that's still a lot more than the 200 measurements we were able to make in this uh, original protein engineering campaign. So how can we use these to improve our predictions and avoid non-functional sequences? Well, one way is we can use this kind of pre-trained fine-tuned paradigm where we initially train on natural protein data existing without labels. And typically the method for this is to use a neural mass language model, model where you take the sequence, corrupt it, run it through a neural net, and then your neural network learns to reconstruct the sequence then you take that and hope whatever it's learned in natural sequences helps it to make better predictions on the downstream task for your given sequence variants. I'm going to predict the fitness. And if we do this with databases, uh, across different uh, model, ar model architectures, if I increase the number of parameters, 
I get better pre-training performance. So that re learns to reconstruct the original sequence more accurately. And the most commonly used model here, it's called ESM1B. It's a transformer model. And it turns out these models are very good at learning structure, for example. So nowadays, uh, there are these new models out where you can take in a single sequence. It runs those through a protein language model, which has been pre-trained to reconstruct sequences. And you can use that to make very accurate structure predictions. And also in general, the longer you pre-train, the bigger your pre-trained model, the more accurate your structure predictions. So what I'm showing here is on the X is the pre-training performance. On the Y is um, three class secondary structure prediction accuracy. So before pre-training, uh, we can get about 70% accuracy with these models, model architectures. After pre-training, the longer I pre-train, um, the better their performance. But that's, that's structure. So we're getting pretty good at going from sequence to structure. But what we actually want is to get function. Well, it turns out that these pre-trained models can also do zero-shot fitness prediction. What this means is people have done these large, what are called deep mutational scanning experiments, where they measure the fitness of many uh, mutants of a parent. And we can run these mutations through a pre-trained language model and get the likelihoods, compare them to the wild type. And they do pretty well if you uh, correlate those likelihoods to the fitness. So these are some older MSA-based methods. PSSM is a linear model. Uh, EV mutation deep sequence are both trained on related proteins for the protein of interest. You can see they do pretty well. And if we take um, a state-of-the-art pre-trained protein language model, we can do about as well without having to do an MSA search for each individual protein. An interesting thing here is that we remember on structure, the longer we pre-train, the better the performance. That's not necessarily the case with these zero-shot things. For example, uh, on this data set, the longer I pre-train, the bigger the model, the better I do. But then this one, the longer I pre-train, the bigger the model, actually the worse I do. So that's kind of concerning about whether the pre-training task is correct here. And now let's go back to out-of-domain performance. So here, Here's just two very simple data sets. One is that one versus rest illustration I showed. The other is low versus high. So here's the results. These are experiment correlations with pre-training on the test set. So the first thing you notice is that those just aren't very good. This is a very hard out-of-domain task. Although in both these cases, we do improve over not pre-training. But if I didn't take a very small CNN with no pre-training, I can actually do about as well as the large pre-trained models. So these are generally bad. These experiments are not useful for engineering. And the pre-training doesn't always beat the baseline. And generally, out-of-domain performance does not improve with further pre-training. So, so here we can see across different uh, pre-trained model sizes, a smaller or better pre-trained loss does not give you necessarily better downstream performance. So our proposal is to use other data modalities to improve models. So here's our paradigm. We want to do a pre-train and then fine tune. And we've been using sequence. But it turns out we know a lot of other things about proteins, such as their some functional annotations. We know structure. Sometimes we know the substrate or the ligand that um, there's free text because these are important papers. And then we know that everything in protein is actually at the um, fundamental level determined by biophysics. So to summarize, we want to use ML to design proteins for therapeutics, for new chemistry, and for many other things. We want to use uh, existing data to make better predictions, but pre-training and sequences isn't good enough, so we're proposing to use multimodal models. And with that, uh, thank you for your time. Yeah.